What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. It's Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy Nick. I am joined here today with a special guest. And that guest is Adam. Now, is this Pfeiffer or Pfeffer? I should have probably. Yeah, you got it the first time, man. Pfeiffer? Yeah. That's what I thought, but then I, uh, I, I you ever seen Along Came Polly? Once a long time ago. Yeah, his name was Pfeffer, and I'm like, I'm about to fuck this up. But we got Adam Pfeiffer <laughs> here from. Roto Curve. He specializes in DFS, so we'll talk a lot of DFS today, but he also dabbles in season long, as I'm sure every single person that watches us does. And this is just a weekly video. You know, we run through the key injuries, we run through some must sits, some wide receiver cornerback matchups, some must starts, and a bunch of other shit. You guys know the deal. And so we're not going to get too deep into intro, but I want to introduce Adam. Adam, say what you got to do. You know, give, give the people a little background on, on yourself. Yeah, so I do a lot of dfs now in terms of content but when i first started it was just strictly seasonal and um it's funny the people i work with sometimes they tell me like to kind of shut up about the seasonal because i <laughs> still like seasonal still like my first passion like i i love answering questions like that on twitter and stuff like that so I, i'm still a big seasonal guy but yeah I, I, i'm a senior analyst over at roto curve we and it's cool because this is the first year we've kind of brought the two together so we do seasonal and dfs um, which I think is really unique. Uh, most sites, you kind of only have one or the other. I also host a podcast every night other than Friday and Saturday night is when we record. And again, it's DFS and seasonal. So for instance, my co-host Ricky and I, we record Sunday night after the games and we break down every game, what happened, injury, stuff like that. Monday's our first glance at the next week. So we'll look at, we'll break down each game for the next week, talk about it from a DFS perspective. And then throughout the week, we'll do podcasts such as like seasonal for waiver wires and stuff like that. So uh, it's a really nice balance. I really like it. And um, I'm glad that uh, we kind of mixed the two together. Um, and yeah, I'm glad to be here. I've, I've seen your channel. I, I like your content. So it's cool to it's cool to kind of link up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm the same way. I'm I'm basically only season long now, but I get so many questions about DFS. I pretty much reply the same thing every time. I'm like, nah, I, you know, I don't gamble, which is a huge lie because I'll, <laughs> I'll gamble on games straight up. But I just... I don't know. Right. I, I don't do the DFS too much. So if you guys are, are into DFS, give I will have Adam's Twitter handle and uh, the name of his podcast listed or just linked on the uh, in the description as well as just listed on the bottom of this video throughout the entire video. So make sure you go give him a follow if you enjoy the content and uh, we'll get into it. We'll start off with the key injuries as we always do. The first one I'm thinking about is Darren Sproles. You know, he fucked all his shit up. We got the leg, we got the <laughs> arm. Um, and now, you know, obviously he's out for the season. And we got LeGarrette Blunt there. We got Wendell Smallwood. And we even got the uh, Corey Clement back there too to, to mix things up even further. And I'm looking at, you know, who do you want to own season long? Is there someone that you prefer more than the other. Um, I would say, for the most part, just a very general view. Like small head looks like the play going forward, especially in in PPR leagues. But what's your what's your kind of breakdown on that? I, I honestly think I prefer Smallwood, but like with Doug Peterson, I think it's going to be really game specific because the dude's kind of a, a nut job in terms of his play calling. Like like super inconsistent and questionable play calling. Like you look at last week, Legarrette Blunt was kind of rolling. Uh, against the Giants, and then he didn't. He barely played the second half in a you know competitive game. So I do think it's going to be game specific. But in, in PPR leagues, I prefer Smallwood because I think he's just going to take over Sproles' role, and he led the team in snaps in Week Three. So he's who I prefer. I'm not like like this wasn't this isn't a week like Week One or Week Two where there was a ton of waiver wire. Like Week One, you had Tariq Cohen and Buck Allen and stuff like that. Um, this week's not like as loaded. So I'm not like if I'm set at running back, I'm not really in a hurry to go get either of these guys because I just I just think the Eagles are going to be like top five in passing volume this year anyway yeah exactly that's kind of that's kind of why I see Smallwood as the preferred back there like you said they're, they're going to flip-flop that game script you look at week two and what Blunt, I don't even think Blunt had a carry it maybe had one touch or something in the week and then this I think week he had, I think he had a catch yeah exactly <laughs> like what is that so they both had 12 carries last week uh, both look good but again they're going to split it and Small Smallwood's been leading the the backfield in snaps for the last couple of weeks, and with Sproles out, he's going to take a lot of that work. And there's such a high pass volume offense that you know the running back that gets the work in the passing game is going to probably be the most valuable. So um, thoughts on him in in uh, DFS? Yeah, people are going to play him. Um, like he's cheap. I probably won't. I just 
I don't know. Like, I think Corey Clement only played seven snaps, but he scored that 15-yard touchdown. Like, I would anticipate him playing more. They signed Kenyon Barner for whatever it's worth. Like, I, I kind of want to wait and see first. And I know in DFS, like, if you're kind of like the first person to get, you know, on a player, like, like people who kind of didn't think Kareem Hunt was a real deal and faded him are kind of looking stupid. I'm not saying he's going to be Kareem Hunt, but yeah. um, I don't know. I just... I'm just not crazy about the whole situation. Um, prefer him on DraftKings, obviously, where you get the full point per reception, and we think he's going to be the pass catching back, but mm, not really crazy about it. All right. Yeah, I hear you on that. Uh, so let's move over to Kelvin Benjamin. I don't I don't think we have any updated news as to, like, concretely what his deal is uh, for this week. I mean, if you look at the replay, his leg went into, like, a V-shape, so... I'm going to go under the assumption that he is going to miss this week. Well, we'll, we'll analyze it from that point of view. There's no structural damage or anything. Yesterday, he didn't practice. He was just riding the bike, they said, on the side. Um, that being said, you know, behind him, you already have Greg Olson out. We got Devin Funches as a wide receiver, too. I feel like we've heard this narrative before with Funches, and, like, it doesn't seem to me like he could be um a real replacement i don't think he could be a wide receiver one especially in the passing offense that's like struggling right now what are your thoughts on on funches season long i can't imagine him being anything more than like a a low wide receiver three flex and then like dfs wise what are you thinking yeah like this is a super frustrating season because i'm like i'm a huge cam guy like i i love cam like i i think i just love players that people hate like i love cam people hate him i love odell but um but yeah, like he's struggling right now, and it's it's just I don't know if it's just you know getting acclimated to the new style of offense. But um, Funches is a guy I'm not even looking at in seasonal. He's just more of a cheap DFS play potentially. The Patriots defense has been awful. They have no pass rush, which hopefully will help Cam. But honestly, I think I just all this just goes to McCaffrey even more um, out of the backfield. Like I think he had 11 targets last week, nine catches over 100 yards, and. You know, you expect him to be behind in this game, in, at least in week four. I mean, you obviously know McCaffrey's value the rest of the season in PPR is going to be pretty pretty substantial. But you know, I do like him a lot this week, too. The Patriots have had some struggles with pass-catching backs. Um, and, like, who is he competing with targets for now? I don't think Benjamin's going to play. Funches is kind of a guy who I think is going to either score or not do much in, in, between, in between the 20s. So I just think it's going all to McCaffrey. I think he could see, like, 10 to 12 targets again like who else is there i mean curtis samuel's more of a gadget player at this point right now they're not really using him as a receiver they might have to but i saw him get some carries like no greg olson ed dixon's just a guy like i just i just think that's even solidifies mccaffrey even more you know what though i i kind of see that as a double-edged sword like it say benjamin sits you're looking at this carolina offense and you're like mccaffrey's got to be the play they're gonna feed right. him 12 targets but, like, who is better at singling out one player's playmaker and just stopping them on defense than Bill Belichick? You know what I mean? And, yeah. You know, they, a, haven't been, they haven't been good on defense. Definitely not. But I think the fact that if Benjamin sits, McCaffrey will be the only dude that they're going to have to kind of single out. So that that's what kind of makes me nervous about McCaffrey. I'm sure the volume will be there and the targets will be there. Um, but I'm a, little, I'm a little more skeptical about uh, McCaffrey than I think a lot of people are this week. Yeah, um, I want to see if Dante Hightower plays. I know he didn't he didn't play last week, and he's like, I think he was top ten in coverage last season among linebackers per PFF. So like that's big, but I don't know. I, Cam can't be this bad, right? Like I know he's not accurate, but Dude, like he can't I, be this bad. I know this is crazy. What's happening? Because I'm I'm with you, man. It's like I was very much expecting at, at least some sort of bounce back from Cam, and he he's showed nothing so far this year. Yeah, like. I don't know. His accuracy issues are just that he's never been an accurate quarterback, but it's even like more evident this year. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't even I, I actually just dropped Cam in one of my uh, in a 10 team league. I already had Drew Brees and I was kind of flip flopping them, but I'm, <laughs> I'm done with Cam after last week. I, I started him over Brees like a, like an idiot. But, wow. Uh, yeah. It was, you know what? Like Brees is out. He was away and Carolina hasn't been the worst past D and then Cam's going against New Orleans. But Whatever. I don't, I don't really want to talk about it. Uh, we'll move on to Matt Forte. So Matt Forte is this turf toe. He dealt with it, uh, I think they said in his rookie year, and it took him a while to kind of get through it. But they're putting him as week to week. He's he's not going to play a game uh, in week four. So that leaves the backfield kind of split between Bilal Powell, who a lot of people, myself included, were pretty high on coming into the year. 
and uh, he'll be splitting work with Elijah McGuire. Um, and m my my thought for this is, you know, Forte is going to be back. So in, in season long, this isn't like a huge uh, value boost for Powell. But uh, you know what's funny listening to your first podcast this year? I'm so far out of the DFS range that I didn't even realize the word chalk was a thing. So I want to <laughs> say, like, is Powell – is Powell super chalky this week? Um, as I get crap out of my face, um, <laughs> he might be because people will look at what he did last year when Forte was out, and he just went and he just went nuts, right? But I just worry about this Jets offense as a whole. Like this Jaguars defense minus the Tennessee game is is tough. Yeah. The one thing I will say, this lightning is crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, the one you, thing I will say like is on your face. <laughs> the one thing I will say is. Um, like, where else are they going to go? Because those boundary corners are yeah. as good a, as good a group as you can find in the NFL. Like, Jalen Ramsey has been, since the second half of last year, arguably a top three, you know, shutdown corner in the league. And yeah, I don't think throwing his way. I don't think Jermaine Curse and, and Robbie Anderson are giving him a lot of trouble. So, like, and Mercedes, or, um, Austin Sverry Jenkins, you know, we still haven't seen it from him put it together. So, like, in terms of pass catching, I don't know where else they go. So I, he's fine. Um, I don't. I think he'll be pretty highly owned. I'll have some shares, but I'm not expecting much from this offense. Like I just, I just really respect the Jaguars' defense. Although McCown is McCown has looked respectable, but I don't know. It's like you could look at it both ways. Like it's a horrible matchup, but at the same time, I don't like where else are they going to go? Yeah. So you you kind of consider him more of like a, a low end RB two, a flex instead of yeah. the, like the RB one we saw at the end of last year. For sure. Yeah. And, like, they're mixing in Elijah Maguire. Like, last year, they weren't mixing really anybody in. Yeah, so. it, was, it was all Powell at the end of the year. Right. Uh, What else do we got? So, the last one I kind of wanted to touch on in terms of, like, skill players is Doug Baldwin. And I know, like, the groin injury is not considered to be anything serious. Uh, he's not really going to practice a lot this week. But I think Pete Carroll already said, you know, that he's going to be limited, but he'll be fine to go. Um, my, my thing is more so, like, they get this good matchup against the Colts. Now, Vontae Davis is expected back uh, for the Colts. I mean, there's no telling that he's going to be the same, like, top-tier kind of cornerback he was over the last year or so, whatever. Um, Baldwin primarily runs a lot of his routes out of the slot. So I, I see Baldwin as – I'm getting a lot of questions on Baldwin. Like, should I start him? Should I trade him now? And I'm like, first of all, we saw Wilson bounce back, uh, you know, last game. And I think we, we're going to see a nice game out of Wilson again in week four. Uh, what what are you thinking for Baldwin in terms of you know like DFS this week? Yeah, so like in terms of a seasonal perspective, like I know it's tough they play Sunday night. I wrote up Paul Richardson in my waiver wire article because mm -hmm. like you could just add him if you have roster space, sit on him, and then you know sit and wait and see what happens with Doug Baldwin. Obviously, Baldwin's good to go. You just play him. But if not, I mean you have Paul Richardson who. Might see more Vonta Davis, but like it's a great matchup. The Colts have allowed the most twenty-yard passing plays in the NFL this year, and that's kind of Paul Richardson's game. And like people don't talk about it, but this Seattle offense goes deep a lot. Like I know they're known for running the football, which um, has kind of tailed off a little bit the last couple of years. But uh, Wilson, I think, is six in the NFL in deep passing attempts this year. Uh, the Colts have gone twenty deep passing plays, thirteen and a half yards per completion. That's the most in the NFL. So I think it kind of works for Paul Richardson if he had to be. Uh, you know, if he was thrust into a bigger role, and then you know, if Baldwin's active, you just play him. Yeah, same thing DF, for Lockett too, and, I'd say. Yeah, exactly, and they're both super cheap uh, in DFS. Of, DraftKings, I don't know if you know this, they took away the Sunday night slate, um, or the Sunday night game on the main slate, which uh -oh. is very controversial right now. People are not happy about it. Uh -oh. So if you are going to play this game, you got to play on FanDuel or another site. But um, but yeah, like it's it's. It's really tough because, like, people – like, I like this game for the Seattle offense, but obviously you're going to have to get your exposure elsewhere. But, yeah, I think both both receivers are in good spots. Yeah, I, I would even say a stack, right? With like a, a Wilson-Baldwin-Richardson stack if um, yeah. Baldwin's in the game. I think that's a solid Yeah, you definitely could. Yeah. Um, I know I'm just going to run through a couple quick, like, injury updates. Tyler Eifert is expected to miss multiple weeks. I think at this point he's definitely droppable in season long. Uh, Jordan Reed is still banged up. He was close to playing last week, ended up not playing. Vernon Davis filled in. Uh, it was a really weak matchup against the Raiders. 
And they get another Monday night football game. Uh, you should already have an alternative for Reed if you have him on your lineup, considering he didn't play last week. So uh, w- what's your take on that? Like when you have someone who is playing on Monday night, say your alternative is like a, is like a Sunday one o'clock game. I'm in the, even if it's like 50, 50, I'm always in the, in the safer side. Like I'm not risking having a zero point total in my tight end spot. Yeah. I'm usually like a risk averse player too. I, it kind of depends on the player. Like for instance, like the Odell Beckham situation in week two, like I was fine waiting for Odell because just I'm, I'm biased towards him and I know how good he is. But like with Reed, you have to be extra careful knowing, knowing his, you know, history, but yeah, I'm usually in the same boat as you. Like, unless it's like an Odell Beckham or like AJ Gray, Antonio Brown, one of those high, high end players, I'll usually take the safer method, but yeah. Um, I, I'm also, like I said, I'm more risk adverse. Yeah, that's a good point with Odell, though. If it's a player like that with so much upside, it's, um, it's almost worth, you know, risking yeah. it. And also if your replacement player is like a four o'clock game or something, you could also wait the extra three hours and see how your game is shaping up. Right. If, if you're, if you're trailing, exactly. big, you need more upside, then maybe stick with Odell there. But who and like, I'll, I'll feel like, like if I bench, like if I have like, Jamison Crowder on my bench and he goes for two touchdowns, whatever. But if I have Odo Beckham on my bench and he goes for two touchdowns, I feel like a dickhead. Yeah, like, <laughs> exactly. You feel like 38 times worse about it. Yeah. yeah so I hear you. Um, then we got Andrew Luck still not practicing this week. Reports are saying probably not till November. Uh, I don't even, I don't even really want to waste my time talking about Andrew Luck. Randall yeah, Cobb. me neither. I took him at the end of all my drafts and haven't been able to use him. You know what? So in my, uh, in my big money league, we have a rule where you draft it. If you're in the tenth round or later, if you're picked in the tenth round or later, you you can be kept the next year for the for the draft spot ahead of it. And this right. year, Andrew Luck was picked in the fifteenth round, right? And uh, someone just dropped him on my waivers. I picked him up for Fab uh, for like eight bucks out of a hundred dollar budget this week. This was right before the reports came out that he wasn't playing for November. I mean, I already have Breeze, and I picked Luck up, and now I'm like, eh, I can keep him next year for a fourteenth round pick if if I want to, you know. So I guess. Like I'm okay there, but now I'm, it's kind of like dead weight on my on my roster. But I guess yeah. in my situation, it's not the worst. Uh, moving forward, Randall Cobb practiced in full. It'll be him, Adams, Jordy. If anyone had Geronimo Allison, you could. Uh, Sam Bradford did not practice again on Wednesday. This this seems like a much more serious injury than they're letting on for Bradford. Well, well, Mike Zimmer said it was. Uh, <laughs> you see his quote? He was like, "Yeah, he's he's fine." <laughs> He's like, he's fine. He might miss one week. He might miss six. He might miss six. Not, yeah. Not, might want to change your definition of fine there, pal. Like, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, this is concerning. Um, I mean, like, I, I don't, like, obviously it's easy to say this now, but I don't think Case Keenum's, like, god awful. No. So I'm not, like, I, and obviously after what you saw last week, like, they'll be fine. Obviously, it's a little bit, it's a lot better if Bradford's under center, but. But yeah, I mean, it's a little bit worrisome when it's the same, you know, obviously dudes had torn ACL issues, so. Yeah, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm more so in, intrigued by the whole, obviously, like, Stefan Diggs and Adam Thielen situation. Because like you said, like, Keenum was playing on the Rams, right? It's the same kind of offense that, that Jared Goff was playing under last year where everyone was like, oh my God, he's the worst. And now he looks way better this year. Could have been the same, you know, case for Keenum. That's that's weird how that worked out. Case for Keenum. Uh, <laughs> now uh, I'm I'm getting a lot of questions about you know should I start Stephon Diggs and after last week and week one it's almost impossible to sit him but I'm kind of nervous this week against Detroit because they have Darius Slay on the outside who's um, he's not always a, a, like a straight up shadow cover but he's really good when he is shadowing and they also, I mean he he probably will this week though right because Diggs is running on the outside now. Yeah, yeah, he's doing most. Like he's of not a he's not a time. slot guy anymore. Thielen's like top ten in, in routes and and targets in the slot. So I actually wrote up Thielen too. Like I like him this week. I like him too. But I, you know what I was looking at, and I hate like just straight going off of like pro football focus ratings and stuff because it doesn't always right. tell the story. But uh, their slot cornerback uh, Quandre Diggs has played really well this year too. That whole Detroit defense has just looked. Um, they're like a whole nother team this year. Yeah, um, he has, but. There's a, there's a whole season last year of him being someone to target, so yeah. <laughs> I'm still I'm still leaning towards that side. Um, and I just like Adam Thielen. I think he's a good player. And the thing I will say about Diggs, though, like obviously if you bench him, you're 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 just you know you're losing it. Yeah. 
But he's going to have these big upside games now he's running out wide because he his like average up the target last year was like seven and a half or eight. And now it's over like towards 11, 12. Mm-hmm. And he actually leads the NFL in deep passing receptions. Like he's he's just making a lot more big plays, which is obviously boosting his upside. So it's it's really interesting how the two kind of just like they kind of just like swap roles. And um, it seems like Thielen's more of the safer PPR guy and Diggs is more of the upside guy. Yeah, he's the truth. What uh, if you had to put money on one guy? Thielen or dig straight up half point PPR for this week. What do you say? I'm going Thielen. Okay, I think I, I really, I really like him. There. I think Diggs being on the outside makes him a little more volatile, especially with uh, Keenum at quarterback. So those are like the injury wrap ups, kind of. I wanted to talk about two dudes who have been suspended and they're coming back in the next couple weeks. So we have Willie Sneed returning this week. We have Doug Martin coming back next week, and uh, you know you got him for a discount, obviously in your drafts, and now people. You know, they don't know what to do. I'm getting so many questions on Doug Martin, whether or not to trade him, what to do with him. Um, and then Willie Sneed, obviously, do you do you start him this week? And I'm looking at uh, the Saints kind of passing game. And obviously, Breeze is still as elite as ever. And I, I think a lot of people made a big kind of deal about Ted Ginn running on the outside in the preseason and getting more snaps and more work than Sneed. But I also think like the Saints had the lowdown on the suspension coming and they wanted to get Ginn as much work as he could on the outside. Right. Um, and I was looking at some snap numbers, and Brandon Coleman's seen a lot more snaps, actually, than Teddy Ginn has so far this year. Um, I feel like, for the most part, we see Ginn as, like, a, a Devery Henderson type in this offense. Uh, maybe, like, a little better all-around wide receiver. Um, but, in my opinion, I see Snead coming back in here and, and being the easily the, the wide receiver, too, in this offense. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. I, I, I have him in a league, and apparently, like, Sean Payton was, like, really kind of non-committal about his role this week they they want to see what he looks like in practice plus it's a london game so I, i'm gonna wait until friday obviously to kind of decide where i'm at with him but like for the rest of the year i love him like in this offense breeze has looked good and their schedule gets really really nice mm-hmm. um starting this week honestly so yeah i'm, I'm all for willie sneed he was he was really good last year um i think you see him get more stuff down the field this year too without cooks which will definitely help because he hasn't been a huge yardage guy. He's just been like, just his catch rate's been huge. Like he's, he's got great hands. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of Willie Sneed. I don't know if it's going to have, I mean, it, it easily could. The Dolphins defense is terrible, especially the secondary, but um, you know, just kind of wait and see the practice reports. Cause that's what Sean Payton was saying that they're going to do uh, with Willie Sneed. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm wondering where they're going to have, like I was high on scene coming into the year because obviously they got rid of cooks and I'm like, Sneed's going to run a lot more, outside route so we've like seen his floor already you know the 900 and four or five touchdowns him running outside more I think will you know like we don't know his ceiling yet and it could be it could be monstrous you know and um I was looking at some of the numbers from PFF and they were saying he had the most or the fourth most uh yards out of the slot last year over 700 the seventh most receptions out of the slot um and they get Miami in week four they let up you know nine catches and 100 yards to Keenan Allen and they even let up five catches for 42 yards to Jeremy Curley last week. So I like I, I guess keep an eye on the reports. Like you said, they're not sure what they're gonna do with Sneed, but if you're really trying to fade the public, which I'm sure a lot of people are not gonna be in on Sneed, he I think he could be a sneaky play. If they if they line him up in the slot a lot, uh, I think he could really take advantage of that terrible Miami pass D. Yeah, I agree. I, I I've been like they made their debut obviously in week two because of the hurricane. I was picking on them right away with the Chargers. Like they're, oh, yeah. they're I don't their secondary has like one good player, and it's Rashad Jones. Yeah, like, it's, it's awful over there. I don't know what yeah. they're doing. Um, then we got Doug Martin. So, you know, for the most part, we've seen a combination of Quiz and Charles Sims. And uh, the snaps haven't been divvied up really evenly. Again, it's only a two-game sample size. Quiz is 45% of the snaps so far on the season. Uh, Sims has 38%. So it's not that big of a gap. But Quiz has 63% of the team's carries, um, but he doesn't have a single target. He doesn't have a single reception on the year. Sims has four targets, three catches. And my concern with Doug Martin coming back is that I, I don't see them moving Sims out of this third down, like, pass-catching role, right? Because last year, Doug Martin came back in, I think it was, like, week 10 when he when he was fully healthy, played, like, that six-game span where he averaged over, like, 21 touches a game. And you're like, that's, you know, that's workhorse RB1 type type workload. And uh, I'm not really sure we're going to see that again this this year, right? He's obviously going to 
make Quiz redundant as a runner. He'll get those early down snaps and, and most of the goal line work, but I'm afraid he's not really going to have much PPR upside with Sims there because they really love him in Tampa Bay. Yeah, like I was, I've been kind of saying this the entire offseason. Like, I think it's going to be a committee the whole time. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't know if they're just going to give Doug Martin like that huge workload. So I didn't. Like I took quiz in the beginning in the in, or not in the beginning of drafts, but late in drafts for the beginning of the season, um, and like I just I d- kind of don't want any part of it, like, and I don't have any part of it. I mean DFS is different because there's you know it's you know it's specific situations obviously week by week, but yeah, I'm I'm worried that they just kind of go with a little bit of the committee, like maybe give Martin I don't know like sixteen carries, quiz nine, you know Sims four. Yeah. Obviously, Sims will get passing down work. Yeah, my uh, it's like you first have to worry about the workload if they split things up there. And then second of all, like Martin's been super volatile throughout his career in terms of effectiveness, right? Like one year he's averaging three yards a carry. The next year he's up at five. Like there's no guarantee that he's coming back as like his prime time, you know, Doug Martin kind of style of running here. So I'm still a little nervous on that. I also don't own any shares of him. But for people that do... I would say, you know, if you're in need of a running back, like if you are are desperate, definitely he's definitely someone to hold on to and see how the situation works out. If you're pretty set at running back, why not go to an owner who's struggling maybe one and three after this week and they're looking for like a win now kind of trade and, and they're weak at running back? Target someone who's losing a lot of games, who's weak at running back, and try to upsell Doug Martin there without even knowing how effective he's gonna be. That's kind of the strategy I've been I've been saying to uh, a lot of my subs. Yeah, um, I think that's a good call. Like, I, I just worry that, like, this is also an offense that last year, like, over 80% of their touchdowns offensively came from the pass. Like, they, they like throwing the ball in close. Now they have even more personnel to do so with, with those two tight ends, with Mike Evans and with Deshaun Jackson. So um, I'm definitely tempering expectations with the running game in Tampa Bay. I, I like how there's, like, a crazy trend every year of these, uh, of, like, someone coming into the year with suspensions and, and other shit like that. It's kind of it's kind of made the draft process a little crazy because you're getting guys. You know, you'll you'll see Doug go anywhere from like fourth round to like the tenth round in the in your summer drafts and stuff. And it's just I don't know. It's I'm more in the boat of kind of staying away from those guys. Or I feel like people have a lot of optimism on guys who come into the year suspended or come into the year uh, with injuries. For the most part, it takes a lot longer for them to get into the groove. You know, you're not just like three weeks. Like it usually takes like an additional one or two weeks to get back into the uh, to the swing of things. You know? Yeah, just look at. I mean, it wasn't suspended, but look at Le'Veon with the holdout. Like, yep. He, I mean, he he hasn't looked great. He got he gets production because he gets you know thirty five freaking touches a game. But yeah, like that. There's definitely there's definitely a thing there with just guys who are, haven't been in the system, haven't been you know constantly with the team. Let's look at some wide receiver cornerback matchups. I like to go through these, and I usually do them based off you know just the pro football focus rankings, but more so like on a common sense standpoint. The first one I kind of want to touch on is uh, this Arizona versus San Francisco game. We have Larry Fitz, who just went off last game. Um, Finally, I had a lot of people worrying about Fitz because I was a huge advocate of him in the preseason. Coming into the season, I was like, he's the only target there. He he led the uh, the NFL in receptions last year. There's nothing that can go wrong until (laughs) the first two games happen, and I'm like, okay, everything is going wrong. He comes back last uh, last week with like what thirteen catches, one hundred and forty yards, and a touchdown or whatever. Now he gets the San Francisco uh, pass defense, and they have Quan Williams as their slot uh, cornerback. He runs 100, almost one hundred percent of his routes from the slot, and Fitz is like 70 percent from the slot. And uh, this this kid Quan Williams is like the fifth worst slot cornerback, um, according to Pro Football Focus. He's it's not a very good uh, corner there. So I, I'm thinking Fitz kind of continues the trend, and he's someone that people kind of need to have um, in their lineups. Now, what do, you, what do you think for Fitz? you think he's volatile, or you think he'll be a safe like PPR play going forward after last week? I mean, I don't really think for the most part over the last how many seasons, I don't really think he's been volatile at all. No. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so now. Um, especially with, you know, I know John Brown's practicing, but he's not a guy that's just going to take away targets. Like Fitzgerald's still going to see, like, what do you think his floor is for targets? Like 10? Yeah, it's got to be. I mean, I, w- like, what was the low of this year so far? I don't even know. It, it was probably like seven, honestly. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, like they're at home. Palmer's looked much better the last two weeks, which has been huge. They're, yeah. They have no running game whatsoever. Like they have, literally have not been able to run the football 
against the Colts and Cowboys the last two weeks. So, yeah, um, I think you have to like him. And, and, and for DFS, like, obviously we're talking about a veteran, an older guy. Like, this is a time where you definitely feel safer playing Fitz earlier in the year when he's, you know, a lot fresher. So, yeah, yeah, like Fitz, like, like I was talking about this on my podcast, like, after the Monday night game. Like, is there anybody out there that just doesn't like Larry Fitzgerald? Like, I don't know if anybody exists you that just like, doesn't like Larry Fitzgerald. Like, on a personal level? Like yeah, like maybe the Eagles because he just wrecks them every year. Oh yeah, and I, I know mean, that because I'm in the Philadelphia area and it's oh. great. Like I love it. Damn, I was like, uh, why are you so into Buffalo? Why why are like the Bills? Your I was squad? born in upstate New York. So uh, damn, I was like hoping you were still there because I'm. Uh, I was trying to see what the uh, Bills Mafia is all about. Is that the truth over there? Those tailgates, the truth. So funny. It's funny because I've been to a lot of Bills games, but it's like well, it's I, funny. I've, uh, I'll, did you see Barstool's last video? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I was the star, but um. No, like when we go, I go with uncle, my uncle, my brothers, and um, we take like my little cousin. So we don't actually go to the tailgates. We go, they have like these things where you like literally park in somebody's um, backyard Jeez. and you just walk to the stadium. It's like two minutes away. It's the most Buffalo um, I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. But um, next year, I think Buffalo plays the Eagles. So a bunch of my buddies now are probably going to go up there because they love Barstool. So mm-hmm. they're gonna they're gonna bring like their cameras and try to get somebody like jumping through a table. Jesus so Christ. yeah, I can't even say like I, I've been in one of those situations. I know their fans are are obviously crazy. Like um, you know, I'm just the guy that sits there in my tie rod jersey and watches watches the shit. Like I'm oh, just so just you, there. So you're not trying to get a concussion pregame? No, I'm good. Um, <laughs> yeah, like, and I'm I'm pretty sure they stopped serving alcohol at, at halftime. Like I think they just they do that at, at Giant Stadium too. That might be like a league wide thing. I'm not sure. Well, I know so I know a lot of a lot of teams. It's the end of the third quarter, but Buffalo was like, nah, you know, screw this. I mean, you see what the hell's going on here? We're going, we're going to second quarter. Yeah, like, we're gonna have someone done. jumping onto the fucking field. From the <laughs> don't third, have to the second the quarter. Third level, really. yeah, yeah, that's fine. I just wanted. To, I, I was hoping you were from Buffalo because I'm like, bro, I'm coming up sometime this season. <laughs> um, but on the flip side of that game, the zone of San Francisco, I'll just cover this quickly. Patrick Peterson is the only cornerback so far in the first three weeks that has shadowed the opposing wide receiver. In all three weeks, one, two, three, um, they go up against San Francisco. He's allowed two catches so far through three games. He's only been targeted uh, three times, and uh, that's Patrick Peterson. And I'm sure he's going to be stuck on Pierre Garcon. So um, <coughs> we'll get to some must hits later in the video. But uh, that's I just want to throw that out there for anyone who's like questioning Garcon uh, to throw him in there, even though he's seeing high volume. You, you can't play him against Peterson because it's almost a guaranteed uh, shadow coverage there. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't play dudes against Peterson, Jalen Ramsey now, Xavier, and probably Xavier Rhodes and Janoris Jenkins. So it's like those are the four guys I definitely don't like. Like Richard Sherman's tough, but like, like he struggled with those smaller receivers, which is why I think Ty Hilton could actually have a nice game, and nobody's going to be talking about him. Yep. Um, but like he's had a weakness. Like Patrick Peterson, since he's had that you know that health issue with with the with the um, what was it diabetes. Um, He's just looked like a machine. So, yeah, those are like the four guys that just don't target receivers against. Yeah, he's scary. Um, you got any noticeable, like, matchups that you're thinking of? I didn't even realize PFF had the, uh, like, the tight end coverage matchups on here. I just realized I think that the, I think they just added that. Yeah, I, I thought that was new. Do you think, like, I feel like that info is not as, you know, maybe I don't know the X's and O's of, of the NFL game that much, but... I can't imagine that like one single safety or one single linebacker is like the main cover guy in a tight end, right? I I have to feel. I like mean, I think it's. I think we saw the 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 main case for that, and it was Week One Thursday night. You know what I mean, Eric Berry against Gronk, like that's. Yeah, yeah, that's that, true. That's kind of like. But it would a only be in that situation. situation. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because that, that that's a really cool tool that I just noticed this morning. I could definitely uh, use that a little bit. I wanted to talk about the Oakland receivers, the matchups with Denver here. Um, you're staying Man. away. You're already shaking your head, huh? <laughs> Did you watch them on Sunday night? Yeah. I, that I game was so tilting because I'm up by 50 points, right? I'm going against Kirk Cousins at prior. Like, I'm like, all right, we got this. Car throws a pick, second play of the game, quick touchdown for Cousins. Like, he's like their offense, the Raiders' offense, literally not on the field all game. Bro, I'm I sitting needed- there just. Pissed off. I needed like four. I had uh, Derek Carr and Amari Cooper in one of my leagues. I needed like fourteen points combined from them. I got that's like, brutal. I got like seven. I was like, you got to be shitting me. Yeah, they're all. Bad. That was like I because 
obviously the Ravens looked horrible in London, but I didn't watch that game. So like from a per, like from a straight up like watching perspective, that Raiders offense was one of the worst things I've ever seen. Like, holy shit, that was terrible. Yeah, do you um, have and it was of, tilting. Do you have uh, do you use NFL Game Pass where they have the condensed games? I want to, but I don't. So this one of my subs, shout out uh, Huey Zulu. I could th- I could send it to you through Facebook. He sent me like a link that uh, you could you could watch the condensed games. I mean, it's like one of those like uh, I guess like a torrent website or something. I guess they just stream it through Game Pass for free. I'll send that link over to you. I'll I'll put it in the description for all the subscribers if they want to see it. Um, but yeah, I just he sent it to me like a day after I split the package with like two of. Uh, Two of my friends, one they do a, a another YouTube channel, but we we got the Game Pass for like a hundred bucks, so we we all paid thirty three a piece. But it's pretty sweet how they do the condensed games. Like half hour, yeah. you could watch everything. And you could even split it up. You could put in like a specific player if you want to see and just watch all their routes or all their rushes. Just oh, that's it. really cool. Yeah, so it's, it's super useful if you're like analyzing rather than just going straight off like numbers and analytics and shit. Um, yeah, yeah. So you're saying for se- like season long, you're. If you have like any kind of decent option, you're getting Cooper and Crabtree out of the lineup. You think? Yeah, like I'm not, I'm not playing Amari Cooper this week. Like I don't have my rankings up, but like let me, I'll like give we, you, I'll give you a couple players. Like, that, like we talked about Thielen, definitely playing Thielen over him. Okay. Um, what about? I'd play Marquise Lee over him too. Interesting. I was gonna say I think Lee is probably the play there uh, in Jacksonville. I've been on the Alan Hearns train. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Mark Lee's league could be nice this week. Um, would you play Rashard Matthews against the Texans over? Yeah, no Corey Davis already ruled out. Yeah, like, like I think Cooper's averaging like three for thirty-five and no touchdowns. Yeah, I put up a I put up the splits yesterday of Cooper and Crabtree. It was like it's bad. It, it's really bad, and it's even worse when they're at Denver. So I guess yeah, like, like Derek Carr like has struggled in the division. Like I have no faith. Um, like the other side of that game, I love, but like. I, I have no faith in Amari Cooper. Like the drops are back too. Like he had like yeah, what double fuck, digit drops bro? in his rookie year, cut it down to five, and I, he already has seven. I know. Like I'm, I'm always it's like, a really big concern. I hate to yeah, I hate to focus on drops because for the most part, I always feel like they're something that players can fix. Like if you just focus a little harder, but it's kind of uh, and it looked like he fixed. It. That's the craziest part. Like know, he literally looked like he fixed it. And then week one, you saw it with with the the end zone targets. He, he started dropping them. Yeah, had a drop crazy. or two on Sunday night. Like. I don't know. I, I, I feel like it's got to be a mental thing. Yeah, at, at this point it does with all the news and shit going around. It's got to be in his head. Yeah, and but I'm sure he knows. I, I think he'll bounce back. I'm not really like, too worried about him if I'm a Cooper owner right now. Yeah, like for, for season long, I'm, yeah. I'm, str- I'm for straight with both of them. But like, I don't I don't like this spot at all. Denver, I feel like Denver was just waiting for this game anyway yeah. against Buffalo. They were kind of headed in the back of their mind. Um, and like Tlaib and Chris Harris are just unbelievable. Just, it's not even fair. I know. It's ridiculous. Plus, like, him. Bradley Roby's their third corner. He could start on, like, half the teams in the league. Oh, absolutely. Um, who else do we got? So, a couple other guys that will probably be shadowed. We have Janoris Jenkins against Mike Evans this week. Should be interesting. I think, uh, I think. I mean, Evans, you know, he had Xavier Rhodes on him last week. He ended up He ended up with a decent PPR stat line. Not bad. Um, not great, but I think the good thing is Jameis just doesn't care. Like exactly. He'll throw, he'll throw that shit. By the way, really interesting. Like literally just popped up on my Twitter feed. It was an article about Amari Cooper and his drops. And he says like, he thinks he knows the problem. Um, I'm reading it right now. Oh, he said it's, he said it's uh, most of his drops have been because he's trying to run before he actually catches the ball. Makes sense. But when it happens, that's kind of six times in a row. Yeah. Literally just popped up. Yeah, it's really that's weird. Kind of crazy. That's what you get. That's the kind of analysis you get over here at BD. <laughs> Psych psychic shit. Yeah, we're on top of everything. So, yeah, Evans will get Janoris Jenkins. We'll see who else we got. Devontae Parker. Ooh, what do you think about Miami against New Orleans this week? What do you think about a potential uh, little stack action there? Cutler, Parker, Landry, Stills. Who are your favorites in that game? Yeah, I like Parker. He's, I mean, Stills, you could have the revenge narrative. There's a lot of narratives in that game. You have Stills against his former team. You have Jay Ajayi, who was born in London, playing in London. Wow. He could go nuts. I didn't even know that, to be honest. Yeah, man, he used to play soccer in London. Wow. He I was, not want to play he's soccer a big, against him. He's a big soccer dude. Hell yeah. Um, Are you concerned but yeah, I, about his knee? I like knee? Parker. I'm concerned about Ajayi's knee. I'd be shocked if he, so, if he made it through the season. So am I. We talked about that. Like, I love him this week, but that's literally why he fell in the draft. Like, yep. doctors were concerned about his longevity. So I'm definitely worried about that. 
Um, like if he has a huge game here against the Saints defense, which he very well capable capable uh, is capable of having, I would him. I would sell him high. Yeah. Like I'm I don't I don't like chronic knee issues. Um, for guys who are like they carries. like they straight up said like we you might not even play three years in the NFL. Like they literally said that. Yeah, that sucks too because that means he won't even get a contract probably when he's done with yeah, his career. He'll put up. I, I hope he's I hope he can. I hope he's fine. Like, yeah, me too. But, but I'm a little worried. But yeah, like Parker, I think could go nuts here. The Saints have been like. Like, efficiency-wise, they've been horrible on deep passes, and you know that's what Parker does yep. with Jake Cutler, who loves him. So, um, yeah, I really like Parker. It stinks that this game's the the, the London game at 930, so it's not really on most of the DFS slates, but obviously you're playing these guys in seasonal. Yeah, we can move on to some, I guess, must-starts, must-sits. I usually don't, like, include a lot of the wide receivers because we usually just kind of go over them in the wide receiver cornerback matchups. <coughs> um. My first guy here, and this is an easy one, but I had I actually had him on this list before the ruling on ProSize was out. But it's Chris Carson out in Seattle because I'm getting a ton of questions on him. And for me, he's like a top – he's like one of the top tier running backs this week in, in fantasy, right? With ProSize out, Carson's already getting all the carries, right? He makes Rawls and Lacey both redundant on this team. Um, they're going against a Colts team that's actually admittedly pretty good against the run this year, um, which I'm kind of surprised about. But – they're like, you can't ask for a better game script here. They're 13 point favorites. Um, you know, they, they should get a big lead and they're just going to try to ice it with Carson, who is their best runner. And I, I saw something that like Pete Carroll said, um, someone was going to replace uh, CJ or they were going to give this kid a chance to re- replace CJ Procise in the backfield. But I, I didn't even remember the name. It was someone I've never heard of. But uh, the, the last Roto World blurb I heard was like this kid caught like 300 passes in. J.D. McKissick. Does that name ring a bell at all? No. No. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say. I don't even know who that is. Let's see. 24 out of Arkansas State. This is literally the only blurb on him. Uh, Coach P. Carroll said the Seahawks will give J.D. McKissick an opportunity to fill C.J. Procise's role as the pass came back in Procise's absence. Uh, I can't imagine them just throwing him in there and Carson not seeing at least like 50 to 70% of the third down snaps. Um, so for me, he's like a fully featured back this week in a really good matchup. So Carson's someone you need to need to need to get into your lineups. If, if that's a question for you. Yeah. And like, I mentioned this on our podcast too, like assuming that the game strip goes how we expect it to go and they're just way ahead. Like they're not going to use Eddie Lacy to, to kind of just run the clock out and they're not going to use Thomas Rawls who's had injury history to to run the clock out. So I think it's going to be Carson regardless. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he's. He's a lock, especially now with ProSize out. I mean, there's just – I know the Colts' numbers against the run have looked, have looked good so far, but um, their personnel, I, I still don't think they're going to be able to stop the run um, you know, consistently all year. I don't trust them. Yeah, for, for me, I always look like – and this is even more so on like a gambling thing. If, you, if you're if you betting like money line or the spread or whatever, I really don't feel like you know a team in the NFL season until you're about five or six weeks in. Because the first few weeks are always like bad defenses, bad offenses. Yeah, like like people are talking about the Rams. Like they 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 beat the Niners and wait, and, yeah. and the Colts. Like I yeah I've like been, I, I do like the I do like the offense a lot more obviously, but I'm not calling them like a very good team yet. Like yeah, hell no, I'm with you on that one. We'll see this week. They're playing Dallas in Dallas. Yeah, that should be good. And then they get such a tough slate. I think like week five hits and they're like Seattle, Arizona. It's like one yeah. after another after another. And I'm like I've been telling people. Gurley has surprised the shit out of me. I'll be honest. I was so far off him in, in season long leagues. I've never have drafted him. Uh, and he's looked tremendous, but like, I can't imagine him keeping up anywhere near that kind of efficiency in, with the matchups he's getting going forward. It's just, they've been getting him the ball in space, which has been huge. Cause you don't have to worry about you know bad offensive line play or anything when you're getting him out in space. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like I would, I would look like basically I'm always looking to sell high if I can, like if I can get, you know, better value for what I drafted, then I'm, I'm looking to sell high. Like, I don't care. I don't care who it is. Yeah. I'm the same way. And I was, I was like the same way on that. Like Leonard Fournette after week one, I was like, get him. He's never getting, they're not going to, they're not going to have a game script where he's getting 30 touches again. Like you'll be able to get like wide receiver one value for him now, but probably not again the rest of the year. But I'm with you on that. Sell high is always good. Um, yeah. You got any guys that you, that, that you, if you're getting a question for, you're not even looking at the second player. You're like, line up you need to get him in there for this week yeah i mean i don't want to say it's like a super obvious one but the denver receivers like just lock them in i think they're like and i'm 
I have a lineup right now where I'm just triple stacking. Like, I just, I love, it's such an easy offense to predict, which is why I like them. Like, over the last years, like, 50% of their targets have gone to Thomas and Sanders. Dude, it's ridiculous. Like, it's so concentrated. Yeah. Um, which is why I love it. And, like we said, the Raiders defense secondary was awful last week. They're, like, they've allowed, I think, Mariota was, like, quarterback 13. Josh McCown was quarterback 9 against him. And Cousins was quarterback 5 against him last week. So they've been really bad. So Simeon, Sanders, Thomas, I think could do a lot of damage here at home. Um, I prefer Thomas in this spot. He gets, he'll gets he probably see more coverage from David Emerson, who's fallen off since his Washington days. Yeah. Um, 10 catches, 176 yards. Three touchdowns as well in coverage this year per PFF. Um, and Thomas, like with Mike McCoy now back calling the shots, we're seeing more upside a little bit from him despite not scoring. Um, he's averaging 13.9 yards per catch, his highest since 2014. Uh, Mike McCoy was the offensive coordinator back then, too. Um, 2.2 yards per route run, um, which is relatively higher than it was last year. So I have, like, 100% faith in these in these Broncos receivers this week. Yeah, that's I actually – I had someone ask me, like, Sanders over uh, – Sanders or D. Thomas, and I'm like – I mean – I'm a I'm a Demarius guy, but like it's so hard to choose because like I know it's coin Thomas coin. is probably going to see more yardage, but Sanders for whatever reason has been Simeon's guy inside inside the ten. Yeah, yeah, I'm at, I'm starting Simeon this week. I mean, it's Simeon I'm starting versus, him too in versus, one of my leagues. I'm starting him over Stafford. Yeah, I'm starting him over Derek Carr, which is not a, not a hard decision, but like I like I would play both of those guys over like almost anybody, but the big three: AJ Green, ah, man. I, pr- I play him over Dez. I know Dez is in a decent spot. Yeah. Like I play him almost over anybody. Like they're they're That's locks for me. Yeah. Okay. Um. One more guy I had that I wanted to touch on was was James White. Now he had a terrible week three game. Um. But I I think we're gonna see a nice bounce back here. I mean, the way you look at it is like White is dominating the snaps in that backfield. No matter how you look at it, he's actually getting carries at, at least like five carries a game, if not more, in most of the games. Uh, Rex Burkhead didn't practice again yesterday. I don't think he's practicing again today. I can probably expect him to miss this week's game. And, and he's like the, uh, the only competition there for basically receptions at this point. Deion Lewis has like three or four receptions on the year so far. Um, Gillisley doesn't even have a target yet in the passing game. And when I look at this Panthers defense, at first I was like, this is not a good matchup because they have great, you know, like linebackers in there between Keekley, Thomas Davis and whatever. Uh, but th- so far through the year, they've let up 22 receptions to the running back position. It was seven in one week, seven another week, eight another week. So it wasn't like a blowout week. They're consistently letting up a lot of passing work to um, to opposing running backs. And look at the game. Uh, it's, it's at home for the Patriots. The over-under is like the second highest of the entire week at, at like 49 points. They're big favorites, so they're expected to score a lot of points. I, I, I really like... Uh, I'm really surprised James White had a bad game last week, and I really like him to bounce back this week. It's funny. I actually wrote him up in my value article over at Roto Curve. Um, obviously, prefer him on DraftKings again, full point per reception. But yeah, yeah, like they're allowing seventeen seven and a half receptions per game to running backs, the fourth most in the league. Um, and you White has twelve catches through three weeks. Like you know, that's his role. Uh, he's you know only five thousand over there, so that's a fair price and. Yeah, like I don't like I love Gillespie. I don't know how much success he's gonna have running between the tackles in this game. Um, and like I'm, I like Chris Hogan as well, but I don't know if you can consistently rely on two touchdowns from him. Um, I don't know. I, I just I just like the price, and I think and you know he's gonna run routes. Like he has 72 snaps in route this year per PFF, the sixth most in the league. So I mean, you know what you're getting from him. Like I I, I like the call. I'm I'm with you. I don't think people are gonna be like. I think people are going to see this spot and think it's just going to be like a, a, a void for the running backs, which you know I guess makes sense because it's New England. Yeah. But um, I I'm, I'm with you. I, I wrote him up. Yeah, yeah. I'm on James White. Um, what else can we talk about? What else did I send you over? We got anyone else you want to start? We could talk about some sick guys that we definitely want to. I definitely want to start Tyra Williams this week. Yeah. Um, let me hear about this. Jail Mills sucks. That like is, I got that is I got facts. an argument with people on Twitter because. <laughs> Like, I was excited about Odell coming back for, like, borderline full strength last week. And I was like, if Odell's, like, anywhere close to 100%, he's going to go He's gonna go nuts. He's going to – I said, like – I, I think, think the I exact thing you, I said was he's going to decimate Jalen Mills. Yeah, I remember that. And somebody goes, no, nah, man, he practiced against him at LSU. He's going to shut him down. <laughs> and I was like, first of all, logic is terrible. <laughs> yeah. I was like, all right, let's see. 
And then, of course, he goes for like 80 and two touchdowns. Jalen Mills has been targeted more than any cornerback in the NFL this year. Um, yeah, he's been awful. He's, he's given up – like this is all per PFF, obviously. He's given up 39 – he's been targeted 39 times. He's given up 27 catches, 256 yards, and two touchdowns. Jesus Christ. And Tyrell, because Keenan plays in the slot like around 50% of the time, Tyrell should see him more than any receiver on the Chargers. Uh, he actually leads the Chargers receivers in routes run this year. And uh, the Eagles have allowed 16.3 catches per game to receivers, the most in the NFL. Um, I, I think he's like a wide receiver two this week. I think the Chargers win this week. Like they're desperate for a win. Eagles coming off that victory. Like I think traveling to Los Angeles, I think they win this game. And Rivers bounces back. And uh, like his price on DraftKings, 4,400. Like insanely low. Like I, I'm gonna have a lot of Tyrell Williams exposure. I know he hasn't gotten off to a good start, but I think this is the week. I like that call. I was, yeah, Tyrell was a guy I touted all summer. I'm like, just uh, so many things I feel like were working for him. You know, there was with uh, Mike Williams out. I was looking at like Matt Harmon's reception perception of Tyrell Williams. It was like, it was like, you know, dynamite. And I'm like, this guy's going to break out this year. And it sucks that they're not feeding him the ball because I feel like he, he's looked good when they're throwing him the ball. He could run all the routes and he's catching all the balls and stuff like that. He just hasn't really had the opportunity. So I'm, I'm, that's a good call by you. I'm excited to see if he actually breaks and, out this week. And I, and the one thing I will say, I think this is a game where the targets kind of funnel to Tyrell and Keenan because the Eagles are so good against tight ends. Right. And like, and the Chargers haven't been, like, they're not, like, sitting there like, okay, we need to feed Hunter Henry. He's had games where he hasn't even been targeted already this year. So, um, yeah, I, I just think he's game plan. such oh, a lock. Yeah, okay. That's a good call. I like that. Uh, we'll move over to some some must-sits. And this is this is not really so much a must-sit, I guess, for me, as it is, like, uh, I'm kind of just fading this guy. Because in, in a lot of leagues, you don't really have the ability to, to sit this guy. But I'm looking at Carlos Hyde at Arizona, and he's been like one of the most, you know, fed running backs. He's getting tons of touches. He's like the clear bell cow over there. Um, and you're looking at it, you're like, oh, well, he did it against Seattle last week, so he could definitely do it against Arizona. I mean, two things on that. Seattle hasn't been particularly good against the run this year. Um, and second, he's always, I don't know why, but he's always had Seattle's number. Like looking back historically through his career, he always has big games against Seattle. And I was looking at some of the splits against Arizona in his career. And he's averaging, um, let me see that, 39 rushing yards a game when he plays against Arizona. So while it's great to see him, you know, be the bell cow there and he's getting a lot of the passing work and, you know, basically all the carries, I, I just, I see this kind of, this team just shutting, just shutting high down. I mean, it's not like a lot of great logic to it. And I just don't expect him to put up anywhere near the numbers that he's been uh, kind of posting so far this year. Yeah, it's fair. Um I, I like obviously I don't think you can sit him, but um, like the pa- like the passing game has been huge for him. Like I I kind of yeah. whiffed on Carl Hyde. Like he was so weird in the offseason. People were saying he might get cut, he might get traded. Like there were so many players. This was such a tough draft between guys like him, CJ it was Anderson, like Spencer idiotic Lair before with, he went down. With Hyde. Yeah, the reports on Hyde were just straight up dumb. All like didn't even place. make sense at the time. No, but he's looked good. But yeah, it's not a great spot. Um, for me, I mean, obviously the, the Oakland guys, I want no part of Marshawn yeah. Lynch. I'm just kind of off in general now the rest of the year because he's so game script dependent. Yeah. But, um, going away from that, like it's, it's hard to sit him obviously, but I don't like the spot for digs. Like we talked about. Yep. And, um, I guess another guy would probably be Stafford. Um, he's had a lot of struggles in Minnesota and I don't know what the, Vikings are going to do with Xavier Rhodes. Like, I don't know if they're going to sh- whenever – because Tate will run most of his routes on the slot. Sometimes it'll be on the outside. I don't know if they'll shadow him or not. Yeah. But um, I just don't like the spot at all uh, for Stafford. So, like I said, I'm playing Simeon over him. I would play Simeon, Tyrod, Palmer, Rivers, Watson, Goff, and Dalton all over him this week. Yeah. I would. Jeez, I don't know if I can – I, I like Dalton I a lot too. Off. Yeah, dude, I like Dalton a lot too. I feel like he hasn't been as bad as people are saying he's been. I mean, he's missed a couple throws that have looked bad, but like really, I think, I think it's because the games that we've watched him, like the Thursday night game, every, everybody's watching that because there wasn't else anything else on. And yeah, that was ugly. He did look bad in that game, but like, like a lot of people were on Dalton coming into the year because the offense was so loaded, and obviously now there's no Tyler Eifert, but. Like, quarterbacks against the Browns have, like, the dumbest floor ever. Like, 16, yeah. 16, dating back to last year, 16 of the last 19 quarterbacks to face him have, have multiple touchdowns. 
Really? Like, wow. it's just a mad, like you saw what Jacoby Brissett did. I know. Um, and AJ Green is going to get coverage from McCordy or Jamar Taylor, who he just, he's just going to roast. Mixon's now the lead back there, and he's gives them just a new dynamic and better chances to move the ball down the field. So Dalton, I have a lot of exposure to this week. I think he's really safe and he's owned this team too, for whatever. I mean, I guess cause they suck, but he's, he's owned. <laughs> I mean, he's yeah, owned who them. doesn't? I'm, everyone has a share of the Browns. Yeah. Like um, they're massive floor. What are your, uh, what speaking of mix in there, what's your take on him for season long? I feel like it's really easy to say now after he had the 21 touches last week, like, Oh, this is it. You know, he's got the work and that's it going forward. Like he's their guy there. I'm, I'm like, I'm not skeptical. Like, I still think he's going to be great going forward, but I want to see it again before I write him off as, like, a high-end RB2 going forward. I mean, forward. you just feel so much better if they just cut Jeremy Hill. Like, Oh, yeah. I would love that. Um, I mean, in my seasonal league, I don't have a choice. I have to use him. But I, I feel fine with it. Um, I think it's telling that the first game with a new offensive coordinator, they gave him that 21 yeah, touches. That was the those big, 21 touches. That was the big thing there. Yeah. Like, so, and, like, he, Heels look he good didn't, though too. He like he didn't break any like big plays, but he like he had a couple runs where he kind of looked like Le'Veon, right? He had yeah. the jump cut, so he looked fine. Um, I, I'm perfectly fine with using him. Okay, yeah, I was just I don't know. I just wanted to hear different takes on Mixon because I was so high in him like in the pre. I was in the same boat as every single other person. Awesome talent, but we don't right. know when he's going to get onto the uh, into the workload. Um, but yeah. it's definitely good to see as a mixing owner that it came now as opposed to like week six or seven or something like that. I, I what I wish I would have saw last week, um, the Bengals didn't really have the ball inside the three, like they were inside the ten. But I want to see, I wanted to see if they gave him the ball inside the three. I want to see like that. they had that reception to Gio Bernard for the touchdown. But if if he starts getting carries from inside the two and the three, then I'll feel I'm all in. Like, well, that's the th- same thing I want to see out of uh, in Houston too. Because they're never on the goal line. So you don't know if they're going to yeah. give it to Foreman. You don't know if they're going to give it to Miller. I don't think either of them have gotten a goal line carry yet. Miller's getting Yeah, I don't the, think they have. Yeah, Miller's getting the touches there. But, like, how long is that going to last? And if, if Foreman takes the goal line work, then Miller's, like, really, really not. It's not a good outlook going forward. If if Speaking of, like, if he has a good game anytime soon, get rid of him. I was thinking, uh, who do they play? They're playing the... Tennessee this week. Okay. Tough spot. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, he's definitely a sell-high candidate. But yeah, so let's move on to sell-high, guys. Um, I think you've already named a couple throughout the video so far. Yeah. So one guy I'm thinking about, and it's a lot of the running backs. I, I'm i putting Ty Montgomery on that sell-high list right now. I think the fact that like people really just look at it, and they look at the workload that he's gotten so far, which is ridiculous, right? Um, but he... First of all, he keeps he's left like every game so far with like a minor nick, right? That was a big thing going into, into the season. The two things were like injury concern and workload concern. We've seen the workload. He's gotten like 95% of the snaps or whatever um, and like all the carries and whatnot. But we've seen him leave, I think, two out of three games. He's left and came right back. But for me, I feel like it's only a matter of time before that comes a real thing. And looking at him from an efficiency standpoint, he's been awful running the ball, right? It's like 40 carries for 120 yards or something like that. Three three yards a carry, barely. And at one point, you got to, you're like, you know, time on seems like he might be part of the problem, not the solution there. It, it, the thing with him, though, is like the Packers seem not to trust either any of the running backs that they have behind him and Jamal Williams or Aaron Jones, who's like the has, spark. Has Aaron Jones even like played a snap this year? I, I, honestly, I don't think so. I don't think he has either. Because have to fact check that, like, but... It's been Jamal Williams for like five or six, and then it's just been – because Tom Montgomery is like 30 more snaps than anybody, any other running back. Yeah, um, it's just like what you can get for him right now is so high. Probably you could probably go time on and like a, a a middling wide receiver three, four, maybe like a Mike Evans or something like that. And that's something I would do because I just don't like over the the short term. The volume is great, but the efficiency level that he's at, which is terrible, tells me in like the long term something's gonna have to change if he keeps you know three yards of carry, three yards of carry, three yards of carry. So he's on my sell high list. I mean, he's definitely obviously usable. Like tonight against the Bears, I'm sure he'll be fine, but. Uh, eventually, I just feel like it's going to catch up to him. Yeah, like I completely missed on the situation. I was a big Jamal Williams guy. Like I wrote him up just to get him late in every draft because he could probably win your win you your league. I didn't think they were going to give Montgomery this type of workload. And to be fair, like it's not like he's getting like twenty five touches a game. Like he's only getting like twelve, thirteen carries. Yeah. Um, he's just playing so many snaps, and he's he's got he's having he's having a bigger responsibility in pass protection, which he's missed a couple assignments last week. Um, which could hurt him. Obviously, you know you. Number one rule in the offense: protect Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> yeah. But um, 
Yeah, like I have him in the league, and I've loved having him. It's a full PPR, but if somebody offered, like, I, I 100% get it. Like, I wasn't a huge Montgomery guy heading into the year, so I'm not going to just completely disregard any logic I had coming into the year just because he's been he's been good for me for fantasy. Like, definitely makes sense to sell him high. And, yeah, like, he left with the wrist, um, came out for go plays, and the week before that, I think it was a, a an ankle or a, or a foot. Yeah, something with the leg. So, so yeah. Um, there's a lot of running backs you could look at. So, like, obviously, Gurley is the kind of the – the main guy to talk about just because of his schedule. Yeah, I've used him like um, every week so far as my sell high guy. It's always. I mean, it like efficiency wise, running the ball, he hasn't been great. No. It's just been the receptions. It's kind of he's kind of like the same as Carlos Hyde. Carlos Hyde's been a little bit more efficient, but that's been huge for his value because now all of a sudden he's game script proof. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but like I, if I could get, like, would you rather like if I could get like a Devontae Freeman for him? I would do that in a heartbeat. Oh, absolutely. Um, I love Freeman. If I could get like. I don't, know, I don't think anybody's giving a Odell for him, but if I can get like, I mean, it would have been easier surprised. before last week, but if I could have got AJ Green for him, I would have done that in a heartbeat. Um, yeah, but yeah, like a guy I'm selling high probably, and I hate to say because he's my dude, but Watkins after last week, I mean, just the consistency is not going to be there. It's never really been there with him, and especially in an offense where there's just other guys, he he just makes sense. Yeah, that's a good call. Um. I don't know. I mean, you said Jay Ajayi, too. Neither of us think he's going to last the season. What do you What do you think about Diggs, dude? I think Diggs is here to stay. I think I like Diggs too. People are asking me if they if uh, if they should sell high, and my position is definitely hold unless you're getting some crazy kind of value for him because he's someone that at the end of the year we might look back and I feel like there's a good chance that we're going to say Diggs ended up as a top eight fantasy wide receiver for the year. So he showed that he could do it with Keenum at quarterback. Can't wait to see how he actually performs consistently with either Bradford or hey, maybe even Teddy Bridgewater coming back soon, man. That would be yeah. that would be epic. I would love to see Bridgewater back under center there in Minnesota. Yeah, like I literally at one point, like it sounds messed up, but I literally just forgot about Teddy Bridgewater. It's crazy because <laughs> we haven't seen him in so long. Right, would you rather good. have Diggs or Cooks rest of the year? That's a good question. Uh, I, I'd take Diggs, I think. What about Hopkins? Diggs. Outside of Keenan, a, I, Keenan I Allen. Jeez. Uh, you, you play full PPR, correct? I, I'm in a bunch of different ones. So Yeah. I, uh, I think I would lean Keenan Allen there. Yeah, he's so good. Yeah, I like Keenan. Uh, I didn't get any – I got like maybe – I think he's on one of my teams, but I wish I got him in more leagues because he's just – he's exactly what he was before the injury, and it looks like he's – I mean, his injuries are always just like out of nowhere, and they – Fuck up your he's season, he's but. like I have him in, a, in my most important league, and if I'm watching the Chargers, I just close my eyes every time he catches the ball. I yeah, don't want to watch I him know. get tackled it's ever. The worst. I don't want to watch him get tackled yeah. ever. I had a uh, so my in my big money league last year, Allen Robinson was my first round pick, and uh, I mean obviously that didn't work out. So this year, uh, I took him in the fifth round, and I'm like, as soon as I took it, I was like, I wish I didn't have like th- that hurt so bad to take him again. And then like first week, it's like. <laughs> Boom. There's like certain players you just, you know, you just get so nervous when you watch them play. And yeah. By the I, way, Kelvin Benjamin on the, uh, one of the first players on the practice field today per Joe person from, from, uh, from the Charlotte observer. Oh, so he's so, okay. So he's a little so, status is still up in the air, but, um, that's yeah. a good sign. Cool. So I'm, I'd be fine playing Kelvin Benjamin against the Patriots for sure. I think he's a, I, I think he's solid too. Uh, yeah, it's weird because they've been like, yeah. they've been like cu- using Malcolm Butler off the bench. I don't know if you notice that. Yeah, like he dude. like he hasn't been starting games. Yeah, no, they, he's he's been playing really poorly, and uh, uh, that that defense is just not, which is crazy because they let up the least you know points per game wise last year. They were the the best defense in the NFL. They just have zero pass rush. Yeah, zero. It's pass brutal. Rush. Yeah, now it's it's affecting their. I, I forget who tweeted. I think it was Graham Barfield yesterday. Tweeted, uh, it's like the Patriots are letting up the most points per reception, fantasy points per reception, and the most fantasy points per like rush. Yeah, I saw that. I was like, Jesus Christ, like they're really that bad, huh? Yeah. But uh, I mean, that's interesting. Alex Smith let them up. I know. Although right? I will say, like, I like Alex Smith in that offense. Dude, like, I'm a big fan of that offense this year. I, I love. It's just it's deal. just so perfectly tailor made for him. Like you, you don't need him to go deep downfield when you have Kareem Hunt, Travis Kelsey, and. Tyreek Hill are just so good after the catch. Like, you know, Alex Smith is going to be one of the most accurate short passers in the league, and then those guys are just so good after the catch. Like, it's a perfect fit. That's and, you know, Andy Reid right now, 
probably the best coach in the NFL, yeah. like right now. Like obviously Belichick, but yeah, that's such it, a hard offense to like game plan against because it's like you got a mini Gronk and Kelsey, but then Tyreek Hill can literally do anything, and then you have a real fucking workhorse at running back and Kareem Hunt. It's like where do you even go? I'm gonna send that dude like a like a thing of flowers at the end of the year because <laughs> I Hunt? did a draft the day after the Spencer Ware injury. <sighs> Where'd you get him? Sixth round because Yahoo didn't update the ranks. I love oh, God. And, my, and that team has Keenan Allen, Demarius Thomas, Odell Beckham, Michael Thomas, and Drew Brees. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, dude, there's so many people that just got Hunt at, in like the ninth, 10th, 11th round. I'm actually really curious. Uh, we'll never know the answer to it, but like, I want to know how things would have shaken out if uh, Spencer Ware never got hurt. Because yeah. like, Hunt wouldn't have got this kind of opportunity, at least early in the season. And like, who knows? A couple of things break wrong and like he doesn't. He doesn't break out in any of the games, right? And, like, they're still in a 50-50 timeshare, but I don't know. It's interesting because a lot of people are like, oh, I was on Hunt the whole summer. But it's like, also, this could have kind of maybe saved you from being wrong on that front. But, I, I yeah, know, we'll never know. It's interesting. Hmm. He's dope. He's dope, though. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's such a good runner. He's like he's just it's like it's watch. funny because you would you would think he would be, like, the number one so high. But he's your, your like, mind is just so – yeah. your mind – your mind is just so like set on those thirty and forty point fantasy games. You're like not not trading him. Yeah, you no, crazy? He's, he's like a league winner. You don't you don't move him. Yeah, but yeah. And, and other news, I'm not trading him. Are you crazy? Like I'm not. Tra- yeah. <laughs> no. 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 I mean, after week one, a lot of people were like moving him for Le'Veon Bell and Zeke's and stuff. And now I'm like, Dude. you know what? You know what I always think about? Imagine if he was on the Patriots, right? Week mm-hmm. one, and he fumbled. Oh my God! Yeah, there goes. You know what I'm saying like Cream Hunt he fumbled his over. first carry. I know, I know, and it, but you know what I it hate was? that. By the way, I hate yeah. benching guys for fumbling. I know it's so so stupid. Only like real asshole coaches do that shit. Except for Bill <laughs> Belichick, he can do whatever he wants. He's he's earned that. Uh, I want to run through a couple guys, just a few players, like real quickly, and um, just like your concern level on these guys, and I guess what you would do with them in, uh, in like a season long league. The the two Redskins receivers, Pryor and Crowder. Yeah, so like I was a big. I mean, I feel like everybody's on prior coming into the year. Um, Crowder, I like a lot too. I'm more worried about prior. Um, last, like, and we after week two, I wasn't, but after last week, no Jordan Reed, no Rob Kelly against a horrible defense. And I just think Chris Thompson obviously has been the story. Like, he's been more involved than anybody's thought. And I don't know. Like, I just don't know if the connections there with prior. Like, I still think he's like people are saying. Is, are we sure if Terrell Pryor is good? Like, did you see what he did with the Browns last year? He's talented. Yeah. You don't you don't do that with six different quarterbacks in Cleveland and not have talent. I just think there's you know there's just a there's a like a real presence with Chris Thomas or Chris Thomas Chris Thompson that has really just hurt his value and like he's gonna see probably what six to eight targets a game the rest of the way. Do you think Thompson? Do you think Pryor or Crowder end up either of them end up in the uh top twenty five wide receivers by the end of the year? I think one of them has to, right? Just because of the offense. Yeah. But like I don't know. Like you're right, after last game, Kirk throws for like three hundred and seventy five yards and neither of them that's what are I'm saying. Like, and Reed didn't even anything. play. Yeah, that's craziness. I'm if I'm a, if I'm a, And if and Josh Doxson snaps have gone up each week. And yeah. if they if he stays healthy then all of a sudden, you have like five players in your offense that are warranting warranting targets. So, exactly. yeah, like I'm, I everybody was on prior. Like I said, he was on everybody's you list, and I was, and I liked though, it, but I'm definitely worried. Yeah, when you're into fantasy like we are, and you're kind of in, uh, you know, you're in the ADPs and you're in the drafts early in the summer. It's like you fall in love with you fall in love with fifth round prior, but by the time drafts come around and you need to get him in yeah. the third round, you're like, eh, you know, everyone loves him, but like there's a price you got to pay which is just like you can't just expect prior to be a top eight top ten receiver so it's like at this point you hold them you bench them and you hope that you know you hope that things start to like churn in that washington offense um, yeah and he'll, he'll probably see marcus peters on monday night so i'm good yeah yeah we'll, <laughs> we'll pass on prior for this week um and we touched on amari cooper already season long we're fine with but you're sitting against denver this week uh amir abdullah and isaiah crowell how are we feeling I've seen people say, like, Abdul's a buy low. Like, I didn't realize he had as many touches as he does. Um, so that's pretty telling. But, I don't know, this Detroit team has just never – hasn't been able to run the ball for, like, five, six years now. Yeah. And, like, I have him on a handful of teams just on my bench. Like, I don't see myself starting – like, like I have – I'm in a league where I have Abdul and Gillisley. Like, Me too. They're, they're both risky, but I'd rather just take the risk on, on Gillisley. 
know what I mean? So I, I'm I'm not saying I'm not like worried about him because I was never really like really into him, so I don't really care. Yeah. But <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I do like the fact that he's really seeing more touches than I would have originally thought. Uh, and I, I think he's gonna have some good games. I'm not. I'm more worried about Crowell. Me because too. Duke Johnson looks just like the best player on that team. Like, it, like legitimately, it just looks like the best player on that team. And Crowell is, you know, for whatever reason, like, the Browns have been in games, like, more. They haven't really been blown out. Um, last Yeah, I was, like, all over Crowell last week. I was like, if there's going yeah, to shares. There's gonna be a game to do it, it's going to be against Indy. You know what I mean? And it just didn't happen. So, like, if it didn't happen then, how can you be comfortable starting him ever? Do we think I know there's like this this like thought process that mobile quarterbacks help running backs? Do we think Kaiser kind of hurts because he's been running inside the five? Like he has two rushing touchdowns this year. Yes, I think. yes, that was a point I made a couple of weeks ago where I was like, I'm I made, I made a video that was like top trade targets for weeks one through four, and I was like, Crowell is going to be a good buy low around week four around this time because having Kaiser there is going to, you know, it, just being out of the read option fucks up all the linebackers and so much space is created there. But it's it's working as a double-edged sword because he has three rushes inside the five already, Kaiser, and Crowell yeah. only has one inside the ten. So it's definitely hurting him in that sense. So if he's not going to get those goal line touches... That's I mean, crazy. Yeah. K- Kaiser has more rushing. You said he has three from inside the five? Three inside the five. One McCoy has, the I think McCoy has, like, one <laughs> Yeah, dude, in that's, Buffalo. That's a weird uh, Bills offense going on over there. Yeah, they're in... Uh, I was happy last week. They're in trouble this week (laughs) in Atlanta. Yikes. So I think, I guess Amir and Crowell are also two guys you're holding on to. I would feel much better starting Abdullah on a week-to-week basis than Crowell at this point. Um, Yeah. yeah, I I don't think anybody's trading for either guy, so you're kind of stuck. Yeah, because if you're the one who drafted him, like you're probably one of the only guys that really wanted him in the league. You know what I mean? So at this point, he has no like real trade value. But um, yeah, I'm a little nervous about both those guys. What uh, yeah, I, what about DeMarco Murray? So I talk about this a lot on my podcast, right? Week one, Murray, if you look at the snaps, I don't have him up. I can probably pull him up. But he dominated the snaps over close, Derrick Henry. Yeah. It's not close. Yeah, it wasn't close. And then week two, we we, we learned that Murray kind of had a little hamstring issue, and that's why Derrick Henry closed the game. And then Murray didn't look like he was going to play in week three, practices on Friday. And then he, everybody's like, okay, Derrick Henry's still going to get the workload. And then a report came out that Derrick Henry had like a, a bone bruise or a thigh bruise. And that's why DeMarco Murray saw so much work. And now Murray's practicing in full this week. So this is the week. If he dominates the snaps again because he's fully healthy, he's back then the I'm not worried about DeMarco Murray. Yeah. I but just, if he if it's more like 60-40 and they're both healthy, then I'll be a little worried. But if you are just straight up terrified of Derrick Henry, I, I don't mind trying to get rid of Murray. But like, I think people were over – over hype. And I, I'm excited about Derrick Henry, as, as excited about him as the next guy. But I think people didn't understand the fact that there was underlying situations as to why the the split was what it was, and people didn't see the fact that you know when they were healthy in Week One, Demarco just dominated the snaps. Yeah, it's not even close on it. I mean, the coaching tra- the coaching staff clearly trusts him as their third down pass blocker, uh, pass catcher. If they're splitting early down work, then Murray is clearly the back to own there. Uh, I'm a, I'm a Murray owner in my big league, so I'm like <laughs> I was scared shitless after after week two. Um, I'm still I'm still definitely concerned. I want to see it again this week because I feel like if he didn't bust out for that 75 yard run, which is stupid. Like it's I hate when people just like oh if you take this away. Um, but if that if he did, that's what people that's what people did with JJ last year. I was like yeah, but he's like if you take he out did, the two but he did it three games, times. Yeah, but he rushed asshole. for 200 yards. He yeah. did that. Like yeah, yeah like he did. Like that. it's not it's not like he that's rushed facts. for three one yard touchdowns. Like he ran for 200 <laughs> yeah, yards. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I hated that. Um, so the same thing with Murray though. If if that doesn't happen, you're like you're in no man's land, right? You can't start him. But I feel pretty comfortable starting Murray this week in my lineup as my RB. Yeah, I think I think we see him more closer to just the 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 snap count from week one. Yeah. I just like it to me when you're watching him play though, it seems like it, it doesn't like, he doesn't have any burst to him up the middle. Like it's not, he making, didn't, he didn't last year. No, nah, he's not making guys miss. And I mean, especially long, like, I know so. he was used differently in Philadelphia, but that was the first year we looked at him like the Marco Murray just kind of looks slow. Yeah. It's like, 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 and he's never been a fast running back, but no, he has breakaway speed, but he's not agile at all in between the tackles. Yeah. Um, what else I got on this list? I would, I don't know. I was I was kind of thinking about like the New Orleans um, backfield, and I feel like Mark Ingram might be a uh, a buy low kind of guy. 
So I was looking at some of the numbers, and it was like last year he had 50% of the touches, the running back touches, and like 53% of their production. This year he has, I think, 47% of their uh, touches and 50% of their production. So it's almost very similar. The only difference this year is that um, he's not getting any touchdowns yet. They haven't really had any goal line scores, and I'm sure that's going to increase like eventually with this offense. Um, so Ingram's a guy that if he's going to keep getting the same workload that he had last year, I'm perfectly fine buying low because he's not like he's had any big games where owners are like, no, we need to keep him. I think he's someone you could pry from other teams. Yeah, and Adrian Peterson didn't practice today. He's got a tweaked knee. Um, yeah, so, that. like, that'll – I mean, it's not like he's playing a lot of snaps. But, yeah, I was a, I was a big – Big fan of taking both Ingram and Peterson in drafts and just kind of locking up that backfield. That really hasn't worked out because Peterson just has nothing left and, like, wouldn't be surprised if he even got cut. But, yeah, like, I, I like Ingram. This could be his big week this this week against um, against the, uh, the Dolphins, who are just a bad run defense. So, yeah, no, you know, Lawrence Timmons is, is, is going to play. But, like, I just think he's in a good spot this week. And How old is Lawrence Timmons? He's got to be, like, 45. I think he's like 33 or something. That's so crazy. That's considered old. How old are you, by yeah. the way, Adam? I'm 24. 24? Yeah. Oh, my God. He's 31. He's like not that much older than us. I'm like talking, <laughs> I'm talking about he's like old as shit. Like I play basketball. People are like 40. Like Yeah. yeah. I'm 40. I'm, I'm <laughs> but, but, yeah, like I, I think Alvin Kamara is playing more than people thought, which is like he – he leads the – he's second the team in targets oh, right now. Oh, he shocked me as much playing which is, time as Which is gotten. crazy, yeah. yeah. But uh, I like Ingram. I wouldn't mind buying him low. Yeah, it's not like – You, you, you could get him for really cheap too. Yeah, you could throw him in as like a – as a flex play in PPR leagues, and I think he'll give you like a solid 10-point base going forward. My bad yeah. dimples. I'm a busy man. Um, I don't know. I, th- I think that's, that's basically uh, kind of what I had on the list. I think we covered a lot of ground here. Um, yeah, for sure. I usually get in. I don't know if you it, if you bet on games, but I do some locks of the centuries at the end of my videos where I pick three games that that I'd bet on um, for 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 some gambling, folks. Since you're in DFS, it's kind of the same thing. I don't know if you have any. You ever? Uh, you ever? Bet? I'm like not a good person to ask about that. Not a good person. No, I don't. I don't. I don't bet on games, especially after last week. Like, I'm one of my buddies in the Survivor League, and he always asked me who I'd pick. And I told him last week it was, like, super tough. I was like, if you had to pick, though, I'd probably pick Miami, but it's probably a trap game. And oh, yeah. he was going to pick Miami or Pittsburgh, so he screwed either way. It's like you like you, you so want to pick New England, but you can only pick them once, obviously. So last week was, like, crazy for that. Yeah, Survivor pools are really, really hard. Yeah. You think they're easy, but they're so, they're so difficult. Uh, Seahawks would be a great pick this week, but... Yeah, um, yeah. I'll get into that later with with my people, but I think that's all for now. So I think it'll probably wrap up the video. Um, any any last thoughts, parting words? Any you want? No, nah, man. Just appreciate you having me on. It's fun. Yeah, um, it's a good time. Excited for week four to start tonight. Hopefully, hopefully your thought process in Montgomery can chill for at least another week, so I can get some get off to a good start in week four. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, going I against- need them. In my money league, I'm going against uh, Jordy Nelson, Martellus Bennett, and Ty Montgomery in the same in the same team. I'm like, right, well, I don't even want to watch. Martellus that. Bennett sucks, so that is facts. One of those guys will do nothing. Yeah, well, the other two are probably going to do a lot of something. So I'm, I, I had Jordan Howard on my bench last week, by the way. So Bro. now that he's in my lineup, expect like 30 yards. Yeah, you no and every, you and everyone else. You know how much shit I got? I was like, telling people to bench Howard, telling people to bench Diggs. I'm like, you I'm had like, to. Yeah, I know it was ridiculous. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. All right. Well. That is all, people of the YouTubes. Um, again, go follow Adam on Twitter. Make sure you're listening to his podcast. If you're a DFS person, I will put both of these. are already probably linked on the video right there. And go follow him on Twitter. Everything's in the description. If you enjoyed the video, scroll down a little bit. Give it that thumbs up. As always, subscribe to the channel if you're new. And we will be back on – I'll see you all on Sunday on the live stream. So take it easy.